Well, again, feel free to interrupt this one. So I just have one more topic um, on entanglement entropy in, in, quantum, in, in sort of general quantum field theories um, before I proceed to holography. So, so far, I've talked about um, a half line whose causal domain is Rindler space. And in the context of a CFT and the massive theory, single interval as a, as a function of uh, the length of the interval. And, uh, but of course, there's other possibilities, even in one dimension. Um, namely, we can have the, the region whose entropy we're computing need not be connected. And so it could have multiple components. Uh, and the simplest such case would simply be two intervals, OK? Um, uh, so, um, so our region A could consist of two intervals. Actually, I'm going to name the intervals differently. So we're going to have A and B. And then um, I'll write AB. AB means A union B. And we could be interested in computing the entropy of their union. And in particular, um, one quantity that we could be interested in is the difference between this and um, uh, the sum. Uh, so the sum of their individual entropies. So we can define this quantity. And by subadditivity of the von Neumann entropy, this quantity is non-negative. And furthermore, it's zero if and only if uh, the joint density matrix is simply a product. Uh, so, and this quantity is important enough that it's given its own name, the mutual information. And it quantifies uh, all correlations, uh, including both uh, classical correlation and Entanglement. It doesn't distinguish between classical correlation and entanglement. Um, uh, so this is the kind of quantity we might be interested in in calculating. In fact, one can show that there's an inequality bounding, for example, um, a connected correlator. If you have a, an operator OA, so an operator OA, and you look at this quantity, so to relate this kind of information theoretic stuff with more conventional things we do in field theory, like correlation functions, this thing is bounded. OK, there's some factors. It's this thing squared is bounded above by the mutual information with some factor of 2. And you have to normalize these operators correctly. But anyway, I don't want to go into that. But I just want to say that there is some, you know, when this is small, indeed, there is not much correlation. And one thing that that implies is that connected correlators are small, appropriately normalized. OK? Um, so anyway, so this is an interesting thing we might want to compute. Um, and let me give an example. Um, uh, so let me call this um, endpoints like this. And uh, so for a free massless fermion, Dirac fermion, which is a CFT. This was computed by um, Cassini, Fosco, and Huerta. And they found the following. And in here, we had this, um, we have this cross ratio. OK, so I want to make a few comments. So my first comment is that uh, if you're interested in calculations in quantum field theories of mutual informations, this is the only one. This is the only theory for which anyone has ever exactly calculated a mutual information in a quantum field theory. OK, aside from topological theories where it's 0. So that's been calculated also. Uh, and, um, and so you might wonder why. And the reason is basically that this thing is incredibly hard to calculate 
Uh, now, of course, there's many numerical techniques and semi-analytic techniques and so on, so that's a whole subject which I'm not going to go into, but um, in terms of analytic calculations, it is, we actually basically lack tools for computing uh, entropies in field theories except in super simple cases like where it's essentially determined by symmetries, like a single interval in a CFT, that kind of thing. Okay? Um, that being said, um, uh, we know that um, the qualitative features of this answer hold in general. Yeah? Um, it's not for lack of trying. Uh, we just um, uh, don't have a method. Okay. Oh, yeah. So she was asking why uh, it hasn't been done for bosons. Uh, I was saying people have tried, in particular, Calabresi. Cardi and Tony have tried to push the calculation as far as they could. Um, and so the, the only, right, um, uh, let me say a quick thing about methods. Um, uh, so uh, the way that Cassini and Fos Fosco and Huerta computed this for free fermions <laughs> is actually pretty amazing. Um, they actually wrote down an explicit formula for the reduced density matrix in a, in a basis, in a specific explicit basis. And then they diagonalized it, and then they computed trace row log row. It's the only case I know of in a field theory, aside from numerical calculations, where someone has actually taken the formula trace row log row, and at, at, in the operators computed log of an operator and then trace of row log row. So they did that for the free fermions because they showed that row AB is extremely simple for a free fermion. Yeah. Okay, let me, so um, I, I think that, um, uh, I think Roger is actually going to talk about Rennie's. So, um, uh, so, but I, what I was going to say is that, um, th so this calculation by Cassini, Fosco, and Huerta is very exceptional because they actually wrote down row AB and they computed log row AB, which is even more amazing, and then traced row log row. Now, the normal, normally we, we, we are not powerful enough to do that. We don't have any kind of explicit formula for row AB, let alone its logarithm. And so um, people resort to something called the replica trick, which involves computing these Rennie entropies by this kind of Euclidean path integral methods that are similar to the ones I uh, mentioned for Rindler space. And, and so there you, um, uh, you, you can compute, if you know what Rennies are, you'll understand this. If not, Roger is going to explain it um, in his lectures, but anyway, these are, sort of um, associated quantities which are much easier to compute and um, uh, and then so we can compute the Rennie mutual informations for free bosons um, for any Rennie parameter, any integer Rennie parameter except the one we're most interested in which is alpha equals one which is the von Neumann case and the analytic continuation is out of reach. Okay, so no one knows how to do that analytic continuation to get the von Neumann entry. The Rennie's are, the Rennie mutual informations are known for a free boson and, and, and many other theories actually. Um, okay, so that's pointing to a certain limitation in our calculational abilities, uh, perhaps a bit surprising. Um, you think free boson, what could be easier than that? Um, so, um, uh, but um, as I was saying, this answer, um, uh, nonetheless, um, has many qualitative features that are shared by any CFT. Um, so the first is um, uh, that it, it's, it, it, it's only a function of the cross ratio. And this follows from conformal invariance. Uh, so cross ratio of the endpoints. Um, another thing is that it, um, uh, if you ask, okay, what kind of a function is it? Um, oh, uh, sorry, there's a couple prior things, well, which are kind of obvious maybe. So, okay, one is that the, um, it's finite. And that's because um, 
the divergences are local on the endpoints and therefore cancel in this linear combination. So in general, the mutual information of two regions that don't share a common boundary will be finite in a quantum field theory. So therefore, it, it doesn't depend on epsilon. And since it doesn't depend on epsilon and you're in a conformal field theory, it must be a function of the cross ratio. So this, the order of these should be switched in your notes. First, you conclude that it's finite, therefore it's independent of epsilon, therefore it can only be a function of the cross ratio. Um, another thing is that it's non-zero uh, because otherwise, by virtue of this inequality, all the correlators would vanish and they don't. Um, so these are general, sorry about the general properties of uh, I of AB in CFT. Uh, it, um, so by, by strong subadditivity, the mutual information is monotonic under increasing the size of one of the intervals while holding the other one fixed. And that means that as a function of the cross ratio, it's, it's a decreasing function of the cross ratio. I mean, if you look at what happens, if you increase B2 while holding A1, A2, and B1 fixed, then you'll see this thing actually um, increases as it should. Um, uh, so, um, yeah. okay, so increases uh, as a function of B2, and that implies, so yeah, SSA implies this, and that implies that it decreases as a function of the separation of B1 minus A2. So if I plot it as a function of the separation B1 minus A2 for fixed uh, B2 minus B1 and A2 minus A1, it looks like this. It goes to infinity at zero because um, uh, basically you, as they approach each other, you sort of rediscover the um, uh, UV divergence in the entropy. Um, so for example, um, if they were actually on top of each other, then you see that you would get a divergence at this endpoint from S of A and this endpoint from S of B if they coincided, which would no longer be canceled here. And therefore, you know that it has to go to infinity as the separation goes to zero. On the other hand, it should go to zero as the separation goes to infinity. Um, so it, it, uh, it goes to zero. And in fact, you, you can show on, you know, using a general CFT argument that the rate at which it goes to zero depends on the scaling dimension of the lightest operator. So actually like um, uh, B1 minus A2 to the minus four delta, where delta is the, is the lightest operator, lightest primary operator in your spectrum. Okay, um, oh actually it doesn't have to be primary, lightest operator other than the identity in the spectrum. So, um, okay, so these are general features, but in general, what is the shape of this in a general CFT that depends on the details of the CFT? Okay, and in particular, it doesn't just depend on the central charge. Unlike uh, the entropy for a single interval, which just depends on the central charge. Okay, so you discover much more. If you can compute this, then you discover much more. You know, here we saw already that you can discover what your lightest scaling dimension is and all kinds of other things if you can really get the full shape of this. Okay. Okay, so I'm done with my review of um, uh, entanglement entropy in general quantum field theories. And obviously there's a whole lot more to be said. Um, uh, but I decided that if I started listing things that I didn't say 
it would never end, and I would still leave things out, so I'm not even going to try. Any questions before I move on? Because I'm going to switch to a different topic now. Yeah. Not, not, a, not that I know of. So I, I should say that the free boson in two dimensions is not as easy as it sounds because it has a um, twist to it, which is that if you want a well-defined CFT, it's necessarily a compact free boson. Otherwise, you get an extra divergence. It, okay, so. Now, a compact free boson is more complicated than it looks at first, because now you have non-trivial topology in the field space. And so you get, when you do your path integral calculations, you get instanton contributions, you have to do an instanton sum, and then you're in the swamp, okay? So that's why you might, that's why it's, you know, it's really the fact that it's a compact boson that makes it very, very difficult. So it's not as free as, as it looks. Any other questions? Can I ask you in this general case, uh, so the program case, so if you get the log by taking delta to infinity, is the power of the area? No, no. Um, I can't do it in my head, but if you, if you do what I said, in fact, yeah, this is an exercise. Good. Homework problem. Um, take this formula, fix these two uh, differences, and look at it as a function of this. I mean, there's only really three differences. There's four variables, but obviously one of them you can set to zero. Look at it as a function of this and expand for large values of this. You'll get this behavior where delta is a half, because for a free fermion, the lowest scaling dimension is a half. Exercise show delta equals a half in this way. Any other questions? Yeah. Say it again, if you... If we just, uh, for example, like uh, the D2, uh, D2 minus A2 would be uh, something like the uh, separation L plus LA and so on. Uh -huh. so there will be three variables. Yeah. Two uh, for the length of the interval, then the third is for the separation. Right, right. So could we then, by rearranging this, find the injury for each? Because there will be oh. So this is a particularly simple formula. I mean, indeed, you can take the log apart and write it as a sum of four terms, which would just be logs of lengths. And so then it looks kind of like you have, you know, something like the entropy of, you know, the entropy of this, as if this were an interval, plus the entropy of this, you know, and so you can, but I, I, don't, I don't really know why it ends up you know, being, the, I mean, just this is a very simple theory, and it just, the answer has this very, very simple structure. Um, so, yeah. E even, even this, even the, the reduced density matrix has a very simple structure, which is actually kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. Half, how these depend on temperature? Oh, um, you know, that... That is a good question. Um, so uh, I don't know if that's been computed. Uh, that's actually a very good question. I can imagine that somebody, I, I can imagine that it's computable, um, but I don't know if anybody has done it. But the answer I can tell you is, is almost certainly gonna be that the mutual information goes down with temperature for any fixed configuration. Um, because as soon as you have thermal entropy, then you have less correlation. I mean, at infinite temperature, you know, there's just going to be no correlation anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, I understand that you increasing the temperature, you introduce, like, I don't know, 
No, I think probably even the classical correlation will decrease. I mean, if you're in a noisy environment, then you, it's harder to be correlated with what, what's over here. So my intuition is that, um, the, is that the whole mutual information will just go down uh, as temperature increases. But I, I don't know if anybody has computed that. Any other questions? Right, right. So the method, the method would be to compute Rennie's by Euclidean path integral, where now you're on a cylinder with two cuts, and so on. So indeed, um, it seems like potentially doable calculation. Okay. So now we're going to switch gears, and I want to tell you about holographic entanglement entropy. Um, and there's a lot of reasons to do that. Um, but one way, w one sort of very operational thing to say is that, uh, you know, entropies are incredibly hard to compute um, in general, um, but it turns out that there's a class of theories where they're very easy to compute. So if your interest is in computing entanglement entropies, then this is a great boon. And in fact, in general, holography is like that. It allows you to compute tons of stuff that otherwise you have no way to compute. Not just entanglement entropies, but you know, all kinds of thermodynamic and hydrodynamic transport properties, correlation functions, and all kinds of good stuff. So, um, which is, I think, kind of one reason why condensed matter theorists are interested in, to the extent that some of them are interested in holography, um, uh, are interested in it. Now, um, uh, for my purposes, I don't want to just present it as a calculational tool, which I think undersells it, but one thing that I hope to convey is that it very beautifully geometrizes all of these features of entanglement entropy. It, it kind of puts pictures to them in, in, a, in a way that I find very, very beautiful. And then, of course, another motivation is if, if you care at all about quantum gravity, it's a window onto, onto quantum gravity. Um, uh, now, um, I don't want to assume that people are very familiar with holography. Of course, I don't have time to um, really explain properly, so, but I'm just going to try to give some kind of lightning overview. And it, feel free to stop me, and we can talk about that if, if you want, um, uh, before I go on to the entanglement entropy calculations. OK, so for that, we need to switch gears. So I'm not going to talk about field theory for a little bit. I'm going to talk about gravity. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about general relativity in three dimensions, in two plus one dimensions, um, with a negative uh, cosmological constant, uh, possibly coupled to some matter that I'm not going to be very specific about, so that I could have scalar fields and fermions and gauge fields and whatever. Um, and um, uh, so let's parametrize. So cosmological constant has units of 1 over length squared. So I'm going to write it like this. So this is some curvature scale. Cosmological constant makes space 1 a curve, space time 1 a curve. And the length scale associated to that I'll call capital R. OK. And the simplest solution to the Einstein equation uh, uh, is um, called ADS3, 3 because it's three-dimensional, and it has this metric. So the scale is set by R, and otherwise it's very simple. Three-dimensional, we have T, X, and Z, where Z, so um, X and T, go from minus infinity to infinity, and z goes from 0 to infinity. Or I don't know, maybe not including 0. OK, so let me draw a picture of this exciting space time. Oh, ADS, anti d sitter, uh, a hyphen and a space. 
lowercase d, uppercase s. OK, so here's my exciting picture of ADS3. Well, I'm not going to bother trying to draw the time direction. Here's x. So let's say, at, so this is ADS3 at t equals 0. And um, for some weird reason, I'm going to draw z going down. So this is z equals 0. And this goes to z equals infinity. And here, th so the space is just this part. OK? Now, why did I draw it upside down? Was the z coordinate upside down? Because um, that, helps, that actually helps our intuition. The, um, gr the gravitational potential, you may know, is the coefficient of minus dt squared. Uh, and so that potential is actually going to infinity at uh, z equals 0. So the potential is growing as we go up, which is how we experience the world. And so um, uh, this, we're allowed to put a boundary here because there's an infinite potential wall. Okay, so if you have some particle, some massive particle, which is like wandering around ADS, uh, if it happens to be headed up, it, no matter how much energy it has, it'll never have enough energy to overcome this potential wall, and it'll always fall back down. Okay, <clears throat> so massive particles uh, can't reach z equals zero. Now, a massless particle like a photon actually can uh, hit and, and will bounce off um, if we put the right boundary conditions uh, for the, like, let's say you have a massless scalar, you can put, and you could put like a Dirichlet boundary condition at z equals zero, and then your particle would bounce off, um, bounce off z equals zero. OK, so it's like a box. Um, you have like a ceiling over you. And um, uh, now, of course, this isn't the only solution. Um, but what we can do is we can impose on the metric, uh, on the metric um, that, um, uh, that it looks like that near z equals 0. Uh, ds squared goes to ds squared of ads3 near z equals 0. So in other words, we let the metric fluctuate, which is the whole point of general relativity, um, but with this boundary condition that as the metric approaches z equals 0, it has to approach that form. OK? And if we also impose some kind of reasonable boundary conditions on our matter fields, uh, at z equals 0, then we have a closed classical system. I mean, closed means it's closed in this direction. Of course, it's infinite in the x direction. And we could cut that off if we wanted. We could make x periodic or whatever. But um, as far as the z equals 0 boundary is concerned, it's closed. OK? Not, no energy goes in or out of there. No other fields propagate through there. Um, and, the, and, and, and the ground state, there's a well-defined energy. Um, the ground state is ADS3. Now, of course, um, there's other interesting states. So an example of an excited state, uh, which is static but excited, is uh, called the, is, um, a black hole. Uh, and the fact that, that three-dimensional gravity admits a black hole was discovered by these people named BTZ. Uh, and their metric looks like this. And you can check that, indeed, it is asymptotically ADS. So it obeys the boundary condition. And this 
is just some function, z squared over zh squared. So you see that this f function is going to 0 when z equals zh. So what does that look like? So here's z equals 0. And then beyond that, you can't go. Or you can go, but f switches sign, and then you're inside of a black hole. So this is inside of the black hole. OK, and so you're, everything kind of ends up falling in through the horizon of the black hole. OK, this black hole has a, its horizon is a line. It's an infinitely long black hole. OK? OK, so um, we have this closed classical system. Now, if it happens that this um, GR plus matter system is the classical limit or the long distance limit of a quantum gravity theory, then we have a closed quantum system. OK? Um, is the classical approximation to a quantum, some quantum gravity theory, like some string theory or something, uh, then we have a closed quantum system. And what system is that? Well, you can show that that quantum system is a one plus one dimensional CFT. And, for, and which CFT it is depends on which quantum gravity theory it was, OK? Um, but one thing you can say about it in general is that it has a large central charge. Uh, in fact, there's a formula for the central charge that the central charge of the CFT is given in terms of the ratio of this R, which is basically the cosmological constant, to the Planck length. So um, any quantum gravity theory uh, has a Planck length, which in 2 plus 1 dimensions actually is, is simply equal to g Newton times h bar. In uh, 3 plus 1 dimensions, it would be the Planck length squared that's g Newton h bar. Okay. So presumably, if, uh, presumably this r, which is kind of, if you want, just one second, is kind of a cosmological scale. It sets this macroscopic curvature scale. is presumably much larger than the Planck length, which is a very small scale, as, as is the case in our universe. Of course, we don't have a negative cosmological constant. But, um, uh, but if, you, if, this wasn't sm if this ratio wasn't very large, so if, if these two were similar in size, then you wouldn't be able to talk about it being a classical gravity theory. It wouldn't be well approximated by classical gravity because the Planck length on which all the quantum effects are strong would be the same order as the curvature scale. OK, yeah? Uh, so there's another length scale in this metric, which is just dh. Uh, what does that correspond yeah, to? Yeah, great. So I'm, uh, I think that was the next thing I was going to say. Um, if I forgot to say anything. Right. Um, I'm going to answer that in a couple minutes. Um, so, but what I want to say is that um, uh, what we have here is some quantum gravity system uh, which is well approximated by classical gravity. So the full theory is the quantum theory, but the one we're going to work with in practice most of the time is its classical approximation. And you should think of that classical approximation, so the classical GR plus matter, this was plus matter, uh, is basically a collective description or a thermodynamic description or a hydrodynamic, I mean, it's analogous to like a, um, a hydrodynamic description uh, of the full CFT slash quantum gravity. OK, so here we have uh, some theory with a very large central charge. 
And um, so in other words, in some sense, you can think of it like it's a, it's a, it has a lot of fields. And those fields are necessarily strongly interacting with each other. You can see that because if they were free or weakly interacting, the dynamics you get would look nothing like the dynamics of gravity in ADS-3. So we have a large number of strongly interacting fields. And as often occurs, uh, uh, when you have a large number of strongly interacting fields, you can go to some kind of collective description. And that collective description will be relatively simple. It'll be classical. And it just happens that that collective description in this case is, guess what, higher dimensional general relativity. OK, that, that's the part which is maybe surprising. OK. Um, uh, so um, uh, now you could say, well, what is, you know, is there some kind of map? Uh, but so the CFT, you know, where is the CFT in this? I mean, I, there's no CFT. There's just some fluctuating space time um, on a space with a boundary. So the answer is basically that you should think of the CFT as, as living on the boundary at z equals 0 of the, um, of the asymptotically, whoops, asymptotically ADS3 space-time. So that boundary is frozen by the boundary condition. And it's a line, or it's a, it's a Minkowski space. Um, so if you look at the metric here, what you do is you remultiply by z squared. You, you, you look at the metric multiplied by z squared, and then set z to 0. OK? So it's like uh, z squared over r squared times ds squared limit z goes to 0 is the metric for uh, the CFT. And in this case, that's just two-dimensional Minkowski space. Okay, uh, I'm saying this because this story generalizes to higher dimensions and more complicated backgrounds and so on. But you always basically have this rule in any dimension and so on. Okay, so um, uh, the CFT kind of lives here, but of course you have to be careful. It's easy to fall into the trap of thinking of it as a system which is interacting with this. It's not. It's not another system which lives here and is interacting with the gravity. It is the gravity. Okay. Um, and um, uh, and in fact, um, well, in fact, I can do this here. So roughly speaking, um, the region, so CFT lives here. And remember how I said that if you have a particle with some energy that's, that's going up, it won't be able to reach z equals 0. And in fact, the highest it can reach depends on how much energy it has. So that um, uh, more energetic, if you have something going on here, like the presence of a particle here, the closer it is to z equals 0, the more energy it has. And so roughly speaking, you should think of this region as representing the UV of the CFT, and the region down here is representing the IR of the CFT. So anything that's going on close to the boundary is going on in the UV of the CFT, and anything going on down here is going on in the IR of the CFT. This is low energy stuff. This is high energy stuff. OK? And um, uh, other than that, I mean, the map between the bulk and the boundary is non-local. So if I have some thing which is happening at some particular location in the bulk, there will be stuff happening in the CFT that represents something happening in the CFT. Where in the CFT is it? It's not at a point in the CFT. It's in some region, which is probably sort of centered on, you know, if you were to kind of roughly take the, the x-coordinate of this point, it would be you know, centered at that same x-coordinate, 
And if something was over here, it would be kind of over here. But other than that, I mean, there's no simple map between one-to-one uh, -one map between points in the CFT and points in the bulk. Okay, so it totally delocalizes. You you have the idea that CFT is a local quantum field theory, and so it has points, and it's very important the the spatial structure of the points. And here, this is just all totally scrambled. Okay. Um, now. Well, so, the, um, yeah, so in particular, I'm going to discuss the entropies. Uh, so the entropies match, and that's probably a good count of the number of degrees of freedom. Is there a simple explanation for why? How it's possible that, how it's possible well, so this is, because gravity is funny, so, and in gravity, gravity has this enormous gauge symmetry which moves points in space around. And so um, uh, the number of degrees of freedom is not proportional to the volume in gravity. So it looks like things that look like degrees of freedom in the gravity really aren't. They're really not independent. They're really not there. Yeah. If you, and so this is reflected in the fact that if you, if you try to put too much stuff in some region, it'll collapse and form a black hole. And so you can't sort of, the, the entropies are not extensive, are not spatially extensive in gravity. Okay. So that's a very important point. That's the only way this could possibly make any sense. Um, now, in view of this, uh, an important technical point is that uh, if you want to cut off, if you want to impose a UV cutoff, for example, we're going to talk about entanglement entropies, and we saw that those are UV divergence, and we need some way to cut off the, um, uh, the UV divergences. So you, one way to impose that in this uh, kind of holography is to cut off the space at some z equals epsilon, and that's a UV cutoff. That's one way of imposing a UV cutoff. We just get rid of this very, very UV part of the, of the th this part of the space time which represents the very, very UV of the CFT. Okay? Okay, um, what is the black hole? Um, the black hole represents <clears throat> well, so I guess I should first say the, you know, this is still the ground, ADS3 is still the ground state and the BTZ black hole is a thermal state at temperature T equals 1 over 2 pi ZH. This is basically the Hawking temperature. So we know that in quantum gravity, black holes are thermal objects. They radiate Hawking radiation. And so this thing is a nice static black hole, which um, uh, has this temperature 1 over 2 pi ZH. So it's in thermal equilibrium with an atmosphere of Hawking radiation, which is bouncing back and forth here in this cavity. That's right. Um, so in particular, this is stable. So black holes in asymptotically flat space are not, thermo are not thermodynamically stable. They have a negative specific heat, you might have heard. Um, but a black hole in ADS, which is like in a box, is stabilized by, basically by the box. So it's thermally stable. Okay, um, now one other thing I want to say is that um, uh, you can do more than describe a CFT. In particular, let's say my CFT has a relevant operator in it, and turning it on maybe leads to an RG flow uh, to a trivial gapped phase or maybe to some other CFT. Uh, so these can also be represented. Um, so so turning on a relevant operator in the CFT corresponds to um, uh, changing the boundary conditions uh, for a scalar uh, such that the ground state is no longer uh, ADS3, uh, has um, 
uh, some Z dependence. So what it'll look like is, so this is Z equals zero, and uh, you'll get a, um, uh, I mean, okay, so one thing I, I, that I left implicit, I, I wrote down the metric, I didn't say what the scalar fields were doing, and everything I've done so far, if you have scalar fields, they're just constant in these solutions, in ADS3, in the black hole, and so on, right? But they don't have to be constant, and in particular, it may be that in the ground state, if you have some funny boundary condition, uh, they may not want to be constant. So you'll have some non-trivial scalar field profile as a function of z. Let's say we maintain the translational symmetry uh, in the x direction, but you'll have some non-trivial field profile as a function of z, and that'll back react on the metric by the Einstein equation. And so various things are possible. One thing is that space can just end uh, so Z, uh, so space just caps off. So you have a kind of a wall. So if you're um, living here you, and you approach this point, you would just hit some wall and then maybe you could bounce off it um, uh, at a Z, which is basically the correlation length. So what this represents is an RG flow, let me write it up here, RG flow to a trivial phase. Or you can have an RG flow to a different, um, to a different um, CFT, and then what you'll get is a domain wall where the cosmological constant will change, so you'll have some uh, R1 and then some R2. So the curvature scales will be different on the two sides of the domain wall. So here, in this region, it'll be approximately ADS3. In this region, it'll be approximately ADS3 with a different cur curvature radius. And then they're sort of glued together. Uh, and you, again, you have some non-trivial scalar field profile. Okay? It would be, uh, it would typically be a smooth thing. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you just have some scalar field potential, which is non-trivial, and then it kind of maybe has two minima, and then it goes from one minimum to the other. Okay, I think that's um, uh, my summary of holography. Huh, so, any questions about holography? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so when you have an RG flow from one CFT to another, I think we discussed this yesterday, that there's like some characteristic length scale at which it goes from looking like one CFT to looking like the other, and that length scale will be the value of Z where the domain wall sits. Any other questions? So, I mean, holography obviously has like many, many applications, and um, uh, but I want to get to um, I want to get to entanglement entropies, and it took a while for people to kind of understand that you could compute entanglement entropies in holographic theories, and those people were Ryu and Takenagi, and I guess Ryu is going to be here, uh, so. You'll get it from the horse's mouth, although I'm not sure he's going to talk about holographic entanglement entropy. Um, but again, this is one of these fruitful collaborations because he's a condensed matter theorist and Takenagi is a string theorist. And so they, um, uh, so their starting point was the Bekenstein Hawking formula. Um, so Bekenstein Hawking uh, said that the entropy of a black hole uh, is given by the area of the event horizon in Planck units. And Ryu and Takenagi took inspiration from this. They said maybe for some, maybe it's the case that given a region A on the boundary, let me redraw my ADS. So now we have a region in the CFT, 
And they, they wanted to know what is S of A. And they guessed that it should be similar to this. And so they put in, they said, um, maybe S of A is like this. OK, and then what am I going to put there? Well, it should depend on A. And hopefully, it should be like fairly canonical. So their guess was that it's um, basically the minimal surface in the bulk that's anchored on the entangling surface. OK? So this thing is the minimal surface anchored on the entangling surface. Uh, now, um, it hangs down because of this thing in the metric um, uh, that the x squared has a coefficient which goes like 1 over z squared. So the distances up near z equals 0 are huge. And therefore, it tries to dip into the bulk because the distance down, you know, is, you could say, well, why doesn't it just go straight across like this? Isn't this shorter than this? But it's not because, the, because like this area element here is actually much, much larger than this area element here. So it minimizes its, its area by going First, in fact, perpendicularly, directly into the bulk. And then, of course, it could also go way down here, where the area element would be even smaller. And yet, that would have an additional cost in this area. And so it just finds whatever the, you know, um, the, the minimum is in the end. OK? Um, uh, now, um, uh, as you can see, it's a bit awkward uh, in these cases where we have uh, where this thing I'm calling a surface because of the dimensionality we're in is actually just a curve. Um, so in general, the surface will be co spatially codimension one in the bulk, which in our case is just one dimensional. So we can write. So, okay, so for a 2 plus 1 bulk, uh, S of A, and G Newton is 1 over L Planck. Uh, G Newton is L Planck, and this thing I'm calling the area is just the length. And this thing is a geodesic. Connecting. Endpoints of A. In addition, there's a um, topological constraint, which is not obvious from a very simple example like this. Um, but uh, M of A, so I'm just going to write it now, and then you'll see examples. M of A has to be homologous to A. And what that means is that there exists a region in the bulk that interpolates between them. So if I draw M of A like this, you see that there's this region that interpolates between A and M of A. This topological condition uh, is necessary for the consistency, as we'll see. Um, now, another thing to say is that uh, you know, what, what kinds of numbers are you going to get out of this? Well, the length is going to be, you know, this is, so this part of the formula is purely geometrical. It's just classical, right? And so all it knows is whatever the classical geometry is. And the characteristic scale of the classical geometry is R. I mean, there can be other scales like ZH and whatever. But even here, there's like an R out front, OK? And so we can assume that this length is going to be uh, of order r. And so this thing is going to be like r over L Planck, 
which we've already seen is basically the central charge. So the entropies we'll get will be, will go like the central charge, which is what we expect. In fact, there's a, an expansion in one over the central charge of which this is the leading term, okay? So the RT entropy is the leading term in a 1 over C expansion. And so there's additional contributions. For example, order one, the next term is order 1. And just one second. And those, um, because they're 1 over C corrections, if you go back uh, through the logic of holography, 1 over C corrections are, are bulk quantum corrections. So we're doing things at the level of classical field theory in the bulk, but if we included quantum corrections in the bulk, those would be 1 over C corrections from the boundary point of view. Okay, so, and those corrections, we know how to compute in principle, although it's very complicated, and it involves basically knowing something about quantum gravity in, in the bulk, so they're nowhere near as easy. The really easy thing is the RT entropy. Yeah? Sorry, just, uh, could you explain how you got uh, R over L parking? Right, so um, my claim is that this part of the formula is just, uh, just depends on whatever solution to the Einstein equation we have. And uh, in the Einstein equation, the thing which sets length scales for our solution is R, okay? I mean, that doesn't mean that, of course, it's not exactly R over L Planck, but it, it could involve a ZH or, or whatever, but anything you have, like even if you had a ZH here or a C, those things would always end up giving you something, those things are all sort of macroscopic lengths and the ratio between them and L Planck will always be order C. Okay, so um, Ryu and Takenagi um, uh, wrote this down in 2006, and uh, we have uh, a lot of reasons to believe it, even as, as sort of a general argument from a Euclidean path integral point of view, um, and many, many tests, and so on. Um, and so what I want to do is um, show how it geometrizes these features that we saw uh, for the entanglement entropy. And of course, this is a very long and interesting story, and I'm just going to do a few examples, OK? Um, yeah. What to erase? What to erase? Okay, so my first example is going to be just a CFT uh, sort of, sorry, one interval in the CFT vacuum. And I'm not even going to do it. I'm just going to tell you to do it. Uh, so as an exercise, so I gave you the metric before. Find the geodesic. Calculate its length. Put in a cutoff. So don't if so this this little bit is infinitely long. Okay? This is where the UV divergence lives. And so um, uh, if you do that, which is not so hard, and you use this formula, which I've erased, so let me write it. Um, C equals three R over two L Planck, uh, then you get this. Okay, and getting, you know, you should get the coefficient correct and everything like that. Okay? Um, second one is finite temperature. And here, again, it's an exercise, and you should get the thing we got before with the cinch. 
whatever, cinch over pi t l cinch, I think it was this. Uh, but the more interesting thing, let's look at the plot. And in the plot, we had a turnover from the log behavior at short distances to a linear growth. Um, and how do you see that? Well, what the um, minimal surface does, if A is very small compared to ZH, which sets the temperature, then you just get the same minimal surface you would get if then, then the minimal surface, or geodesic, only probes the part of the geometry near the boundary where the geometry looks just like ADS3. So you get the same geodesic and the same entropy. But if it's very long, then the geodesic, what it does is it dips down. It notices, oh my gosh, there's a horizon here. And it skirts the horizon. You can show it never crosses the horizon. The reason is that the horizon is itself a minimal surface, and minimal surfaces don't cross each other. So you get this behavior, and this part, it skims the, it skims the horizon, and this part gives you the extensive part. Because you know from the Bekenstein-Hawking formula that this horizon carries an entropy density, right? And so, of course, this part of the minimal surface is going to precisely reproduce that entropy density, because it's the same formula with the same coefficient. OK? So that's, this part accounts for this part, this linear part. OK? How about a gap theory? I'm not going to do the RG flow, but <clears throat> It's not that hard. But a, a gap theory has a different behavior because um, what the minimal surface does is different. So again, uh, well, let's, let's recall what the, what the prediction was. The prediction was that uh, the entropy saturates at the correlation length. So it should look something like this, where this is the correlation length. Well, let's see what happens. Now our space is simply ending here. So again, if, um, if A is, is short, so again, the, the, the value of z at which this happens is the correlation length. So again, the same logic applies that if L is very short compared to the correlation length, then you get the same thing you do in the vacuum. In, in other words, in the ground state. Uh, sorry, in ADS3. So I forgot to write what this is. So sorry. Three gapped phase. On the other hand, if it's very long, then the minimal surface will do something very different. It will simply go down and end on the wall. And this wall, it turns out, you might say, well, isn't there a contribution from the wall itself? Just like there was a contribution here from the horizon. It looks similar. But there's a big difference because the wall does not carry entropy. Another way to say it is if you actually calculate in the right units the area of this wall, you'll get 0. OK? So the wall does not carry entropy. And so what do we get as we now change L? It's constant. So in fact, it doesn't exactly look like this. It's more dramatic. It looks like this. And there's a phase transition. 
So this is something new, actually, which we didn't see before. Black hole, you have done something sharp? Nope. You drew it all sharp. It isn't sharp. Yeah. Yeah, so it's never exactly linear. Right. But here it is exactly constant. And you could say, how is that possible? How can we have a phase transition in a finite system? Because after all, we're asking about the entropy of a finite interval. But remember, we're in a thermodynamic limit, not the usual kind that you do in condensed matter, which is some kind of infinite volume limit, but a limit where the number of fields is going to infinity. That's the central charge. So phase transition, uh, thanks to the C goes to infinity limit which again is a thermodynamic limit, okay? Yeah? How do you describe the geometries to allow this wall? Like why does it have zero area? Yeah, so I didn't wanna, okay. L let me say a couple words about that. Um, many different things can happen. Um, uh, you can have, um, so for example, in string theory, you're allowed to have certain types of singularities which are naked and which, you know, where space just ends. And that's a consistent thing to do in, in string theory in certain ways. You, I mean, of course, you have certain boundary conditions and so on. Um, another way that space can end is that, I, I didn't mention it, but often uh, there will be extra dimensions which are um, in some compact manifold and which are not really playing a role here. They're just it's just a product of ADS3 times some compact manifold. So the compact manifold is just the same over every point. But then what happens at the wall is that the compact manifold shrinks to zero size. And in fact, it can do so smoothly so that the whole, for example, let's say the, the compact manifold could be um, a seven dimensional manifold so that the full space time is 10 dimensional, which we like in string theory. Then the full 10 dimensional space time could be smooth. It just, from a three-dimensional point of view, it looks like it's ending. So let me, let me just draw a picture. It, imagine that the compact manifold was just a circle, and it was, it's just a circle over every point for every z, except when you get down here, the circle is getting smaller. And so, in fact, the full thing is nice and smooth, some kind of cigar <laughs> shape. But from the point of, if you ignore this extra dimension, which is a circle, it looks like Oh my God, space just ended here. And now look, what is the area? You have to take into account the, the areas of these compact dimensions, and guess what? They're going to zero. So here you necessarily need to extend this 2 plus 1 theory to higher Right, if you really want to understand what's going on in the vicinity of this, you actually have to go to the higher dimensional picture. That's exactly right. Any other questions? Okay, so, um, uh, and then um, there's the um, two intervals, mutual information. So by the way, I mean, I, I also, everything I'm doing, you can consider a homework problem. So this also, what you can do for a homework problem here is don't worry about this stuff. Just take ADS3 up to some C and then just delete the rest of ADS3, and then, then you should be able to calculate exactly where this phase transition happens and so on. And the next one you can also do as a homework problem. Can people calculate the 1 over C correctly That's a good question. Okay, that's a great question. Um, so um, our knowledge of the 1 over C corrections is not complete. Uh, we have a pretty good understanding of the first subleading correction, which is order one. And we have some vague notions about what further perturbative corrections look like. However, perturbative corrections can never round out a phase transition. So the phase transition is presumably rounded out by non-perturbative corrections, which are like e to the minus one over c. And, um, uh, sorry, e to the minus c. Um, and we actually really don't have any kind of a handle, even kind of in principle, on the form of those corrections. We know they must exist for the reason you gave. 
Um, but um, this, that's one of the actual big open problems. <laughs> Absolutely not. No. I mean, we know it must be rounded out. Yeah. Oh, I have, I have five minutes. Okay. So my fourth example. is um, two intervals. And now we want to compute S of AB and um, uh, so now we have to look for minimal surfaces that join the endpoints and it has to be homologous. So one option is you just find the minimal surface for A and the minimal surface for B. And so one possibility is that the minimal surface for A, B, is the union of those two. <laughs> this is certainly homologous because here I have this region and this region. And the union of these regions interpolates between A, B and M of A union M of B. And this would imply that S of AB equals S of A plus S of B, and therefore vanishing mutual information. However, this is not the only possibility which is allowed because alternatively, you could have had this, and this region which is bounded by these two geodesics is also, uh, or sorry, these two geodesics are also homologous to A union B via this region. And in this case, M of AB is not equal to M of A union M of B. And so we have not. Now, which one wins? Well, whichever one is smaller. And that depends on the separation. So if you imagine a large separation, then you can imagine that uh, surely this is going to be really long. The blue one is going to be really long. And the red one is going to be shorter. On the other hand, when they're really close together, you can imagine that the blue one is actually shorter. And that's what happens. So that's your, that's your homework again. These are really quite straightforward um, uh, exercises, actually. Um, and so as a function of uh, whatever I called it, B1 minus A2, I should have a better name for that, uh, the mutual information is 0 in the red part, which goes up to some particular separation, which depends on their sizes. It, it all just depends on the cross ratio, of course, uh, and is non-zero when they're close together. So when they're close together, the blue one dominates. And the blue one dominating means that, in fact, this is less than this. And so this thing, whoops, there was supposed to be an equal 0 here. This thing is positive. And so it looks like this. Again, there's a phase transition. And Remember, the prediction was, again, that it goes like this. But here we see it's going strictly to 0. Now, um, you might be disturbed that I'm finding a strictly 0 mutual information because, as I said before, that's not possible because that would imply that the correlators vanish. And they don't. But of course, strictly 0 doesn't mean strictly 0. It just means that the order C part is 0. And the 1 over C corrections, which are order 1 and so on, are non-zero. And those are the ones that save the day. So it's only in the C goes to infinity limit when I sort of divide by C and then take C goes to infinity that I get strictly 0. Really, this is small order 1, but this part is order C. OK? So we see all of these um, uh, things being geometrized. and um, uh, the last thing, and of course, you know, one can go on and on and on in terms of examples. Um, but um, I want to switch a little bit away from examples 
and just say as the last thing, properties. So, um, and we, we already saw one here. By the definition, the entropy we got for AB could not have been more than the entropy of A plus the entropy of B because the ryu takinagi formula tells us you always take the minimal surface and one candidate surface is always this one and this one has total area S of A plus S of B. So we have, by that logic, S of AB is bounded above and this is uh, the property of entropy called subadditivity. So essentially, so this is a triangle inequality, and essentially it becomes a geometric triangle inequality. Okay? You can make this proof I gave fancier um, to prove the strong subadditivity inequality. So it turns out that uh, Ryu Takenagi formula automatically obeys this strong subadditivity property. You can, maybe I'll, yeah, I'll call that an exercise two. Think about how you would prove that. Uh, well, I'll give you a hint. If you want the cartoon version. You're trying to show that S of AB plus S of AC is greater than or equal to S of B plus S of ABC, so one side is the total length. And now just reconnect these. OK, that's the hint. OK, um, another property that is true of entanglement entropies is that if the full system is pure, then uh, S of A complement equals S of A. And we can see how that works here. Uh, I think I erased it, but um, well, let's, let's look at this case. Uh, A complement, everything out here, if you apply the Ryu Takenagi formula, you're just going to find the same minimal surface for A. So you're, in fact, going to find that M of A complement, they're going to have the same minimal surface. But now imagine it's not pure. Then this shouldn't necessarily be the case. Why is that? Well, look at something like a thermal state. And now, uh, so I have whatever minimal surface I have for A. The minimal surface for A complement, this is not an acceptable minimal surface for A complement because it doesn't obey this homology constraint. Because uh, what is the region interpolating between this and the complement? The region uh, would be something like this, <clears throat> but it has an extra boundary, namely this. Okay? So in fact, the minimal surface for A complement would look, or one candidate, it could look like this union this. Or it could, another candidate is you can have a minimal surface which does like this. But in any case, it can't be the red line, okay? And so um, in a not pure state, so um, uh, M of A can't be M of A complement. And in fact, uh, so this is three examples. You can show Ryu Takenagi obeys all known properties of von Neumann entropy. It also obeys more. It has other things that von Neumann entropy doesn't necessarily have to have. And the simplest example, I'll just write this out. This is not so easy to prove. This is something that is not generally true of von Neumann entropy, but is true of holographic entropies. So it's something special. And an exercise would be to find a counterexample with a quantum state for this inequality. Uh, so this is not true of general quantum systems. So this kind of thing tells us something about how holographic sim uh, systems are special. 
and there's other ones. Okay, there's like m many, many other things to say about holographic entanglement entropy, but I am way over time, so thank you. <laughs>